Good evening. Excuse me. We have to start the last session of this afternoon. Uh, we have a little bit delay because the previous session finished as well 20 minutes later. So uh, it's. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to to, to chart this uh, session. My name is Stanislav Kamba. I'm from Czech Academy of Sciences from Prague, and the first speaker is Eric Kokain from, uh, from here, from yeah. uh, Gettysburg. And uh, Eric will speak about structure of ultrathin film based on barium titanate oxide, which is actually quasi-crystalline. So please. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me fine? Is the mic working? Um, I would like to thank my collaborators and contributors to um, this project. At some point during this talk, you will probably um, say to yourself, um, what does this have to do with ferroelectrics? So I want to point out that all of these unusual structures that I will be talking about um, originated in experiments where thin layers of barium titanate were deposited on, on top of platinum and they were essentially experiments on the stability of thin film barium titanate under vacuum and temperature. And if that's um, not related to fundamental physics of ferroelectrics, I'm not sure what is. But a surprise occurs when you take thin film barium titanate and you heat it under ultra-high vacuum. It produces these complicated new structures. One of them is a quasi-crystal with dodecagonal symmetry. And so that raises the question, what is the nature of these structures, both the atomic detail and the chemical properties? Um, and the um, talk will talk about how I solved these structures um, through a lot of trial and error and show you what the results were, and then describe the properties of these structures, what they share in common, and how these uh, thin film barium titanate structures are related to other known systems. So this is the, um, chronologically, the first paper that showed this interesting phenomenon. It's by uh, Stefan Furster and Wolf Wiedra's group at the University of Halle in Germany. It was published in 2012, and uh, I consider this to be a remarkable breakthrough work showing new phenomenon in barium titanate. And yet, uh, three years after publication, this stood with one citation, and it was by the same group. So I was kind of using the term reconstruction in the previous slide. It's not really a reconstruction per se. What they did was they heated the barium titanate layer on platinum 111 surface under a vacuum, and it formed islands at high temperature separated by regions of bare platinum. And then at even higher temperature, I can't give you the exact number. It's in the low thousands, I believe, Kelvin. It re-wets the surface. And shows this remarkable variety of structures of the pictures here. Um, this one's a really cute one because it has these, what they call wagon wheels, these sort of dodecagonal looking wheels in it. So it's probably not surprising given the dodecagonal wheels in that structure that in a further experiment, they found a quasi-crystal. And uh, this paper actually got more than one citation, probably because it was in nature instead of surface interface analysis, and certainly has a pretty picture. So here's the kind of characteristic thing that's seen in the scanning tunneling microscopy STM images, a dodecagonal ring of 12. But the interior symmetry is broken in a funny way. There's a central bright spot, and then 
There's a seven spots around that in this pattern. Fortunately, this um, kind of pattern was known mathematically for like 25 years. Franz Gehler kind of showed how you can make quasi-crystal tilings like that. It's uh, not quite the Penrose tiling. It's a different one. In fact, it has, instead of two tiles, three different tiles, a square, a triangle, and a thin rhombus. And it has a common motif of a dode dodecagon with uh, two thin rounds from the center of the outside, breaking up the central ring and forming seven nodes, which correspond to this. The actual um, interatomic separation in this is 6.85 angstroms, and that's similar to the distances in the other barium titanate structures seen. Now, this is um, not, it's of course much large, larger than an interatomic separation, so perhaps it's um, really that's all the atoms, or as we suspected, there may be atoms that are not seen. So we took that as a, um, as a puzzle. We were trying to take this, um, the known tiling and to decorate the tiles in a way that would match the experiment and explain the structure. And it's a lot harder than it sounds because there's many possible degrees of freedom. Uh, in fact, there's several pitfalls that came along the way, kind of this assumption that I should have given up earlier that the composition should be similar to barium titanate or, or at least some kind of charge compensated structure. A uh, second uh, kind of false lead was this related um, tetragonal tungsten bronze structure on like Bosak talked about it yesterday. And you know, you actually see um, motifs in it that look like squares and triangles. So you can imagine them putting them together in that quasi-crystal pattern and, and it might work. Unfortunately, um, I took a lot of effort in trying variations of that and, and failed to see that. And the other thing is like uh, not knowing what those bright spots actually were, whether they were barium, titanium, oxygen, or, or some kind of bonding thing. And so I wish um, I could tell you that this was solved through kind of some kind of clever genetic algorithm or um, you know, just kind of from ab initio considerations. But in the end, it was just trial and error. And in fact, when I first um, tried this decoration, it didn't even seem to me that it should work. So here are the decorations of the three tiles. Bar um, barium is blue. It's on the outside. Titaniums are green. There's tit interior titanium in each one, and oxygen is red. So you look at the overall structure, this quasi-crystal. Um, you get, you know, each titanium is three oxygen neighbors, so it's like a triangular surrounding it. And barium sits in the void, so if you count the number of titanium around barium, it's usually seven. Uh, there's also this kind of dumbbell pore, which I'll talk more about later, with two bariums on the interior. So if you think of a perovskite structure as having a three-dimensional network of corner-sharing octahedra, and the barium sit in the largest possible um, interstitials to that, in this two-dimensional thing, you have titanium O3 triangles joined corner to corner, and barium sitting inside the largest voids there. The, um, I should note that uh, the titanium network is close in composition to titanium 2O3. So that means you, the, the valence of the titanium has gone from 4 to 3. And in fact, that agrees with the experimental observations that the valence of titanium looks like 3. So to kind of corroborate this and to see um, if it made sense, we turned to density functional theory calculations. And first of all, they showed that the structure is stable, that you know, we ran picosecond scale molecular dynamics at room temperature and things did not fall apart. They also show a rumpling of the layers so that titanium is actually lower than the oxygen. It's about 1.2 uh, angstroms, I should say, above the surface of the platinum and the barium and oxygen are similar in height at about three angstroms. And we were able to run a simulation of what the STM should look like it reproduces very well the experiment, provided that we put in some resolution factor to kind of mimic a finite resolution experimentally. So here are the, um, the circle of 12 bright spots with the center and then the seven in it. Same thing seen experimentally. So 
those um, bright spots happened to be the same spots where the blue barium were. And so that struck me as kind of strange why the barium should be the one who, that appears in these images. So I turned to the electronic structure of this to understand that. So here is the projected density of states. It's um, kind of projected inside finite spheres, so it's only semi-quantitative. But um, Fermi level is here. This is pretty close to the black curve, pretty close to the density of states of a platinum surface. It has this kind of pseudo gap above the Fermi energy and then more um, states above that. And what you can see is a, you know, a lot of density of around um, titanium and oxygen near the Fermi level. And you see evidence of um, titanium dominated D states below the Fermi level. I think that represents the one electron filling that's required to get the three plus charge on the titanium. But the barium is very, um, almost nothing and featureless. And yet it ends up being the ones that you see in the image. Uh, the answer to that is topography. So the barium states, they may not be very dense near the Fermi level, but they, uh, they decay slower. So from these um, calculations, the experimental, experimental images are seeing, you know, like electron density, three angstroms above the layer of barium and oxygen. Uh, unfortunately, I did calculations at uh, you know, higher simulated current and at the resolution of uh, 1.2 angstroms broadening, there is no conditions under which you can see all the atoms. But hypothetically, if you can do SGM with higher resolution, it might be possible to see them. And that would be uh, useful to have kind of a direct visual evidence of the model. So having gotten this result for the quasi-crystal, we turned attention back to the older but unexplained um, other periodic crystalline structures. So when you um, have toys and you want to make new structures, you get an expansion set. Uh, for explaining all these other barium titanate structures, we had to create a, an expansion set for the tiles. So instead of the, not just the three before, but this hexagon, a pentagon tile, and this weird distorted tile actually occurs and through them, we were able to reproduce all of the structures. I only show one here because these two are the same thing. Um, it's not very clear, the comparison on these pictures, so I will blow them up to higher scale. So here is one structure that the original paper called Y rows. Uh, you can pretty much see, you know, under the assumption that the bright spots are barium, the model is matching the experiment. Uh, one nice thing I find is that the experiment has a little surprise not anticipated in the modeling. You can see that the, instead of having kind of a perfect mirror symmetry here, there's some shear taking place. So you can, you know, oh, you can learn new things back and forth between theory and experiment. And also, if you like look here, instead of having this region, you have another hexagon. But, you know, the, the model of Tiling using tiles that can fit together edge to edge in various ways just explains that consistently. And here is um, a very simple structure. So it's nice this kind of herringbone structure of hexagons actually observed. And you can see the agreement between the, the model and the experiment under the assumption that you're only seeing barium here. Uh, and again, there are defects. There's a square and a triangle here that, you know, are to violate the perfect periodicity of the structure, but uh, you know they are structurally allowed. And finally, I go back to this wagon wheel structure. On um, the original experiment, they kind of noted and circled some case where you would have a bright spot, and then in a crystallographically equivalent spot, you would have nothing. In this decoration model, this uh, Partially occupied experimental site corresponds to a crystallographically distinct position. Not only is it crystallographically distinct, but it's a case of having um, a ring of titanium-6, oxygen-6 around a center instead of titanium-707, that was the more common one. And if you kind of picture putting barium in a smaller ring, you would think it would go higher up. So I think that naturally explains why you get a brighter contrast here when it's actually occupied than most of the other barium positions. 
So we have a quasi-crystal and a number of periodic structures. What is their composition? Um, so here's the kind of what you would draw for a barium titanium oxygen phase diagram. Here is barium titanate. All these two-dimensional structures are here in the phase diagram, so they are not along the, you know, charge balanced barium oxide titanium O2 nor the titanium 3 plus charge balanced line. So they're not charge balanced means that they are transferring charge to the platinum metal underneath and probably causing some kind of electrostatic bonding then, which may be you know, only possible because it's super, super thin. So uh, I found this disappointing. It got us a uh, frowny face punctuation mark because I had kind of hoped when this began that you could grow bulk quasi-crystal barium titanate and get fascinating properties from it. But if you are going to do bulk things, you'll have to probably get other uh, compositions, other charges of ions, who knows. So plausibility of the model is enhanced by the fact that similar things have been observed in other two-dimensional crystals. So, you know, some exciting recent work about um, silicon dioxide ultra-thin glass. I think um, Pinchman Hain Wong and David Muller and them were the original people. Here's a picture from Buchner and all. And it's kind of funny that there was, uh, 1930 or so, a Zakarian glass model for, for glass. And of course, you can't draw the picture in three dimensions, so they drew a two-dimensional picture of how you'd get you know, this silicon oxide network and how it would go and randomize. Uh, the funny thing is this actual two-dimensional network is what's observed in these ultra-thin glasses. So, Silicon has three of the oxygens roughly in plane, and then it has um, another oxygen just above. And the mirror of that then allows another silicon oxygen for to um, fit the, uh, be there. And you, you know, you're projecting through both of them here. So it's plausible. And um, graphene is another situation where you can have a, a kind of amorphous network where it's threefold coordinated. Uh, various experiments with these amorphous three networks in two dimensions, so the graphene one and the Buchner, um, if you look at the statistics, you kind of get uh, a peak at the coordination rings of six and then uh, fluctuations around that. But the case of the barium titanate is very different. It's really predominantly um, titanium seven, oxygen seven. There's never been a, uh, in all these models, titanium 808. And the titanium 606 is very rare. So I believe that um, the, you, know, you get the primary driving force is some formation of titanium 707 around barium, and then the titanium you know, accommodates the network beyond, around that the best it can. So I'm coming back to this funny, this uh, dumbbell-shaped pore, which is somewhat unsatisfactory looking. But it turns out that uh, just a paper a couple years ago in a related situation where it was a zeolite. Um, so here I'm showing a cross section. They, in fact, observed for the first time a dumbbell shaped pore in those um, materials and tried to model in detail the atomic structure. And what they found was the one case that worked and was consistent with experiment had a dangling oxygen on each side inside. And uh, this is exactly the same case that I found. You have um, a dangling oxygen here. And what's um, amusing is before I came, uh, put these oxygens here, I was playing with a model without them, and I showed it to my colleague, Terrell Vandera Nist, who's a, just, a, you know, has made a career out of crystal chemistry. And after looking at it about two seconds, she said, oh, this can't be. The titanium here has two coordination. It's not possible. And the bariums are too close together. Um, so she was right. These look close together, but they're actually four angstroms apart about the uh, perovskite distance, and they have the oxygens in between to buffer them. So I will um, finish there. Thank you. I'm ready for questions. Thank you very much. So this talk is open for discussion, questions. So, uh, in principle, it, it can happen to any perovskite then? 
Um, in principle, it can happen to any like ions of the right sizes yes. and charges, yes. That's true. STU, for instance. So, for, would you say as Strontium titanate? Yes, in principle, it has the same charges. And have there some experiment showing uh, something else besides the VTO? No, I've heard that the uh, V-drug group has interest in exploring other systems, but I haven't heard of any results. a question in your DFT uh, competition you had uh, a commensurate supercell even for the quasi crystal case so how, how do you arrange the tiles in order to have periodicity, uh, periodicity of something which is not periodic yes you are you are correct I glossed over the details I had to use periodic boundary conditions because of density functional theory uh, there's a well-defined um, approach to making periodic structures that are very close to quasi-crystals. They're called crystalline approximants. So I used the ones that were as, as close as possible to the quasi-crystal. More of a problem is the fact that they're not exactly commensurate with the you know, platinum surface at these scales. So I just, um, you know, I just forced the in-plane dimensions of the platinum to match these. And, Um, it's kind of in between, you know, I could make larger ones now by, by using an algorithm I did. How's the question? Are the stoichiometry ratios somehow related to something like golden mean or some other irrationals that are well defined in the same sense? The in the barium to oxygen to titanium ratios? The yes, range. they um, have um, vectors of square root of three in them, as you might guess, um, based on 12-fold symmetry. Um, yeah, like the um, cosine of 30 degrees being square root three over two kind of thing. Did you try to calculate phonons? That is huh. vibration. No, this is, um, that would be a, wor a useful thing to try. I mean, I know that it's stable, but I didn't uh, calculate what the phonons are. Or, you know, what any kind of derived properties like ferroelectric properties might be. Okay. Thank you. We, sh we should move. Well, thank you very much once more. And I'll ask Nick Barrett, he will speak about evolution of surface charge and the structure through the ferroelectric paralytic phase transition in barium titanate using MEM, REAM. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so my name is Nick Barrett. We come from the French Atomic Energy Authority. Uh, it's actually a joint laboratory with the CNRS uh, in the University Paris-Saclay campus near Paris. And the, what I'd like to show you today is more a, a sort of demonstration paper on what you can do, the sort of information that you can get using uh, mirror and low energy electron microscopy. In particular here, the, the, the case study is the phase transition from ferroelectric to the paraelectric phase in a uh, single crystal uh, barium titanate uh, oriented to uh, 001. Um, as usual, when you start doing something like this, you think it is a... Uh, Should I put this one up? Yeah. Yeah. When you do something like this, you think that it's going to be easy and that everything is known. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, this is not the case. And in fact, there's quite a few uh, results which... I mean, we haven't, we've got ideas as to how to... Uh, how to interpret them, but there are a few results which came out of this which seem just uh, relatively new. So uh, if there are any ideas, they'll be very welcome. Um, now then, this was working and now it's no longer working. 
ball. Let me see. So after a first, first of all, a quick introduction to uh, low-energy electron microscopy and uh, why it's useful, sensitive to studying ferroelectric surfaces. And then basically there are six results, which I'll present uh, rapidly, on how to track the structural phase transition, um, some interesting contrast inversion below the Curie temperature, uh, contrast which, is conti which uh, continues and is evident well above the, the Curie temperature, where you'd expect to be in the purely paraelectric uh, phase, and also some transient structure which appears just around the transition, which we'll attribute to ferroelastic twins. Uh, and then finally, a, a memory effect, um, providing you don't go too high in temperature. So low-energy electron microscopy, uh, it's an electron probe, so electrons are coming in, and you on incident on a microscopic area of the sample, and then you're covering these electrons, either reflected or backscattered, and you're going to create an electron image of a few tens of microns of your, uh, of your sample. So it's ideal for looking. It's on the same length scale as many uh, domain-related uh, phenomena. More precisely, you have an electron gun. The electrons are around about 20, uh, 20 kilovolts. They're accelerated. This, uh, these are uh, uh, electron optics. And there's a magnetic sector field, which means that the electron beam is directed perpendicularly to the sample surface. Um, just before uh, arriving at the sample, the sample itself is also at the same, uh, same voltage, so the electrons are slowed down and they have very little energy, a very small uh, energy with respect to the sample potential. And this is defined by the so-called start voltage, SV, um, which is typically a fraction of, a, of an electron volt or a few volts. Then the, the electrons interact either by reflection or backscattering if they manage to get into the sample, and the same sector field deviates them into the imaging column. There are lenses, projectives to uh, magnify, and then you get the image onto the, uh, onto the screen. So the data looks like this. It's always uh, so some stacks, uh, 3D stacks of, of images, X and Y, the position, microscopic position on the, on the sample surface, and then the Z coordinate is the energy or the start voltage. Okay, why can we use this? Why is it interesting for ferroelectrics? Uh, schematically, if you think of, for example, a, a slab with alternating uh, up and uh, down, uh, down domains, well, this gives rise, obviously, to some kind of surface charge. And this surface charge will modulate um, the, local, uh, the local work function or surface potential as seen by the incoming electron beam. So they're quite simply above a, a, a domain oriented with the polarization pointing out of the sample. Then uh, electrons will penetrate in at a lower energy than above a domain with the polarization pointing into the sample. Uh, one example of this, uh, this was done on a bismuth ferrite a thin film, uh, PFM written domains uh, pointing out of the screen or into the screen, the red and the green. And then, remember, this is a 3D stack, so that if you extract the intensity as a function of the start voltage, as a function of the electron energy, then what you get are two curves like this. These are called MEM lean curves, going from uh, the MEM is the mirror electron uh, microscopy, the lean is low energy electron microscopy. And essentially, the surface potential or work function is about the midpoint of these, uh, these reflectivity curves. And so you can see that there is a, uh, an energy contrast, about half a, half a volt, uh, between the upward and downward uh, polarized domains. So what we have is a non-contact technique, full field imaging, and we have contrast, which is uh, attributed to the effective surface potential as seen by the electron. Okay, so our, our sample, single crystal barium titanate, we cleaned it. This is ultra-high vacuum, so the surfaces must be clean. Uh, we cleaned it using uh, ozone treatment and then uh, followed by annealing at quite high temperature in vacuum. Uh, this gets rid of any residual uh, organic uh, contamination. What it also does is create a certain amount of uh, oxygen vacancies so that the sample is not totally uh, insulating, it's not an ideal ferroelectric, and this is very important. We're using electrons as a probe, and we want to avoid any charging problems which would deform the images. Um, uh, first of all, we, uh, we can track the, the phase transition. Here's a typical image. You can see uh, with the, the crystallographic axes, so you can see the, the striped domains 
uh, they're bright and dark. And then inside these domains, there's also uh, horizontal and vertical finer structure, uh, which in fact we attribute to in-plane uh, uh, domains. Now, if you just crank up the contrast and then you concentrate on the defect, for example, this defect here, um, and then you heat the sample, we can image uh, whilst in situ, while we're heating up the sample. Let me trace out the, the, the sort of path uh, taken by the image. Um, and then we can plot it out as a function of temperature. And this is what you get. Now, here, the, the things are happening below the Curie temperature and above the Curie temperature. This is just thermal expansion of the sample and the and sample holder. It's different because you go from a, a ferroelectric to a paraelectric phase. But this is the, this is the Curie temperature. The, the absolute value of the temperature is not quite correct, uh, simply because the temperature was measured below the sample and not at the sample surface. So there's a, a, an inertia, thermal conductivity. The displacement is basically what one would expect for a 5 by 10 millimeter sample, um, uh, knowing that all the domains are not oriented in the same direction and there, is a, there are in-plane and out-of-plane uh, domains. So that we can, we can track this structural uh, phase, uh, phase change quite easily with, uh, with the instrument. Now, uh, we look at the domain contrast. At room temperature, uh, this is what we have. Uh, essentially, three types of domains, which are labeled, uh, this is a P up domain, a P down domain, and this fine structure, as I said, are the P in plane uh, A, -type, uh, A type domains. Now, as we start heating up, this is what we see. First of all, to getting towards about 100 degrees C, then the, this contrast basically sharpens. Uh, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit smeared out here. Here we're getting, it's getting a bit sharper. As you go higher, if you look at uh, this carefully, you see that there is the contrast inversion between the main uh, vertical stripes. This is around about 120, so we're still below our Curie temperature. Um, you then go to 140 degrees, and we're just before the structural phase change, and there's a second contrast inversion, and this time it is between the vertical stripe and this finer structure, which has now become brighter than the, than the surrounding uh, vertical stripe. So we have two, uh, uh, two contrast inversions below the Curie temperature. Then above the Curie temperature, what do we see? Is there's no more contrast inversion. In fact, this contrast is, has remained. The, what used to be domains in the paralytic phase has got narrow, they, they, they've changed in, in width, but there is still contrast, and it is still clearly related to that domain structure in the ferroelectric phase. And to get rid of this, to see it disappear, you actually have to go quite high. Um, this temperature at 383 uh, degrees C. So what is going on? Um, we can plot out, as a function of temperature, the uh, intensity as measured from the three domain types. And here you see the first contrast inversion between uh, up and down polarized domains, around about 110 degrees. The second one between the in-plane and the uh, upwards polarized domains. This uh, jump in intensity is due to the, the transition. And then you have to go much, much farther to see the, 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 uh, the domain contrast finally, uh, finally disappear. Um, the explanation is adsorbate. I mean, it's not new, but it's quite nice to see it in this, uh, in this way. Uh, if you have a, a fully screened by extrinsic uh, uh, polar adsorbates, fully screened uh, uh, surface, then the upward polarized uh, domain, in fact, to incoming electrons will appear negatively charged, and vice versa, for, for a downward polarized domain, it will appear uh, positively charged to incoming electrons. What we see as well is that these intensities do not change at the same rate with temperature, and that means that the, uh, the desorption energies for the screening molecules on the upward polarized domain are sm is smaller than the desorption energy for a uh, screening molecule on the uh, downward uh, polarized domains. And that's sort of schematically uh, represented here. And we have to go quite far uh, beyond these, the, these two crossovers uh, to get an unscreened surface and to get the true uh, potential, uh, surface potential characteristic of the upward and downward polarized domains. Now, what happens as well, and you saw it in the images, and here it's just plotted out in a different way to make it more obvious, is that when the contrast inversion is happening, and you can see here this is contrast inversion, here's intensity, uh, it's bright for an upward polarized, dark for down polarized, and up here, near but before the Curie temperature, it's inverted. When this starts happening, then the domain walls move as well. 
Uh, they, start, they start migrating. And, they, and this is where it is pure hypothesis. The only explanation we have for the moment is that uh, somehow the, the, the adsorbates, not only are they screening the, the polarization charge at the surface, but also they may be pinning to a certain extent the, the domain walls. And when they desorb, then uh, the domain walls may, uh, may start, to start to move. You also see here clearly uh, that uh, this contrast is related to the, to the domains, uh, this contrast above the, above the Curie temperature. Um, <clears throat> the, it's known the, the contrast above the Curie temperature has already been observed by different techniques. Here's one technique, uh, the same group as was mentioned in the previous talk, the uh, Vidra group from uh, Halle. They used photoelectron emission microscopy and they went above, uh, going above the Curie temperature. They still saw domain related contrast. And then about 15 years ago, uh, Kalnin and others at, uh, uh, at Oak Ridge, using the uh, scanning surface probe microscopy, or, or Kelvin probe microscopy as it's called now, they, uh, they measured above TC uh, residual, uh, residual contrast. And the explanation uh, given by Hofer and, uh, and others, which appears to be the most re uh, reasonable, is that the, these oxide surfaces um, it's not just a perfect uh, uh, bulk termination. What happens is in any oxide surface, the oxygen atoms, oxygen ions, tend to relax outwards. Now, obviously, this is going to have different effects on the surface charge if you're considering an upward or downward uh, polarized, uh, polarized surface. And so you're going to get some modulation. The tendency is, therefore, to maintain a certain tetragonal-like distortion, and therefore, this is probably, uh, uh, there's some DFT calculations which have been done to justify these results. And it's probably what we're seeing in our uh, mem, uh, mem lim measurements, this uh, sort of tetragonal light distortion, which is continuing uh, above, uh, above the Curie temperature. Okay, now, another thing that we saw and we'd <coughs> like to show you is uh, just at the, at the transition. Have I got five minutes? Okay. Uh, just at the transition, uh, at the Curie temperature, we, uh, and we did this several times, it's, it's uh, reproducible. Um, what I'm going to show you is a, is a movie um, in which time is temperature. The uh, temperature is varying over something like 14, uh, uh, 14 degrees. Well, it's accelerated up so that uh, um, so you can see, uh, see more clearly what is happening. Now, a bit of luck. So we're starting below TC and we're slowly, slowly heating, heating up. And now you're going to see the, the mechanical movement due to the structural phase change, but you're also going to see something, something else happening. And you get this amazing uh, appearance of some transient stripes perpendicular to these, the, the, the main up and down uh, polarized, uh, uh, polarized domains. I can do that again just so that you can see it. And maybe if I'm lucky, stop it just at the right uh, at the right moment. I'm not sure. Yeah. So you can see what's happening now. You can only do this in the computer. Right? It, it is impossible to stop. Uh, even I don't know how many times we tried with the temperature control. We just can't stop this. Uh, the, these th these things appearing, but they do appear and they're reproducible. We've seen it on now three or four different samples from two suppliers over the last five years, so we're absolutely certain that, it, that, it, that, that this exists. Um, and how do you interpret it? Well, here are a few stills from the film. First of all, look at the temperature range. It's extremely narrow. It's one degree. Now, the absolute temperature, again, has to be corrected for our offset, um, but the temperature range itself is, is completely reliable. They're kinetic. We can't stop them. Whatever we do, as soon as they start appearing, they go through the, that, uh, the, uh, that sequence. And there's also finer structural changes happening. This is what we'll see in the, in the, in the next slide. We'll concentrate just on, on, on this area, which lead us to suggest that it's due to the real nature of the phase transition that it, we're going through this sort of 111 type off-centering, and it depends on the energy landscape inside the, inside the unit cell. So first of all, if you look at uh, uh, here, the intensity profile as a function of temperature, what you see is that the periodicity is actually changing quite clearly over, uh, over one degree. Here we have a very high frequency, and it's getting down to lower, much lower frequencies once you pass 
the, the Curie temperature and you're into the paraelectric uh, phase. Secondly, if you look at just this small part here, I mean, we could look at others, it's the same, but this is the, so this is the, the background was, is the up, outward uh, pointing uh, polarization. And now you look at the intensity due to these transient domains superimposed on the, on the background. Here the intensity is in orange. This is the background, I think, before, and this is the background after the, the transition. In both cases, the intensity maximum minima due to these, uh, to these stripes, uh, these transient stripes, straddle the average intensity. Now, the average intensity is due to the surface charge. So that here, we're either modulating the surface charge, which seems rather unlikely uh, in the, in the, just at the transition, or we've added something else into it to create uh, contrast in our, uh, in our experiment. And what we think we're adding into it is some kind of corrugation like this, which does give rise to intensity, uh, periodic intensity modulation. And this has been seen before, uh, not in, not in uh, BTO, not in single crystal, but in strained thin films of uh, PZT, and it was done by, the, by Streifer quite a long time ago. And it, it was related to the fact that the, there, there, was, uh, there are four, uh, fourfold uh, degeneracy in the, in the, uh, the off-centering, and that this can give rise, therefore, to a, a 100 type or 010 type, a twin, a twin boundary, depending on the strain, uh, the strain conditions. So last, uh, last slide. What we also noticed is that uh, I, I, I said that we had to go up to about 380 degrees centigrade to uh, really lose any of this uh, structure. If we do more moderate heating, then we can actually maintain that we have a memory of the domain structure. Um, this is no longer an image, it's a map. It's a map of that mem lean transition, in other words, of the local work function. And as you can see, there are basically three local work functions, these fine domains and the, big, and the striped domains. You can plot that out as a histogram, and then you can turn this histogram around 90 degrees and plot out the histogram distribution as a function of temperature. When you got to very high temperature, there's no relation between what you had at room temperature here and what you get when you go back down to room temperature. However, and this is just uh, some very preliminary results, that's why it's not presented in the same way, so it's not as complete, um, if you only heat up to something like 175 degrees C, so just above the, the Curie temperature, and then you go back down again, apart from some, some charging effects, I don't worry too much about that, what you get back is the same domain, uh, domain structure. In other words, this domain structure is robust, basically up to about 175 degrees centigrade, which is certainly higher than any operation temperature for a smartphone. So maybe, maybe it is useful as, uh, as some information. And there you are. I'll leave that up. That's the summary of the results. And uh, thanks also, you, also to the funding agencies and, of course, you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for beautiful data. So questions, please? If I can ask you, uh, you practically observed domains 200 Kelvin above DC, up to this temperature, which is very yeah. high. It's known that, let's say, in Raman scattering, it's seen mm -hmm. such, such persistence of uh, polar phase above DC, but usually 70 Kelvin, yeah. but not so high. It's, that's why I say it's domain-like domain con like, yeah, co yeah. contrast. This is, not, this is not domains. However, um, what the, the, the model, the DFT model which was done, to support or to interpret, let's say, the, the photoelectron microscopy data um, allowed the transition in the bulk of a slab to the cubic uh, structure, but included a tetragonal surface distortion, which is necessary to minimize the, the, the surface en energy. And what they found was that this tetragonal distortion um, they, they could minimize the total energy. Now, this is DFT, so it's still 0K. Yeah? So there's a, there, is a, there is a problem, uh, problem with it. Um, but the, that, is, uh, that is the idea, that it's the presence of the surface which sort of maintains this distortion, and it, it, it sort of looks like, uh, looks like uh, ferroelectric domains. It's absolutely, they're absolutely not ferroelectric domains. You can't switch them. Um, you just straight. Yeah, they're just 
they're just there. Um, another an important point with respect to that is that the if you think about surface stress, stress, uh, mostly in first principles calculations, the uh, you get surface stress um, actually at a smaller zero stress at a smaller uh, value of the lattice parameter than the the, the, the bulk uh, lattice parameter. And this is this is a pure surface effect. So that one could imagine um, that at a surface, when you go down to when you do the transition from the tetragonal to the cubic phase, your surface may be may remain compressed in the, uh, at a smaller uh, smaller parameter than the bulk. Uh, and this, this might be energetically favorable. But we don't observe domains, we observe st contrast, which is clearly related to the, to ways to the domains. Okay, thank you. So please, last chance for question. If not, thank you very much. Mm. Third speaker is Arnold Everhart. University of Reningen, and he will speak about ferroelectric domain structure in low strain barium titanate. Okay, thank you, Chairman. So, I'm going to talk about ferroelectric domain structures in low strain barium titanate thin films. It's a collaboration between the University of Groningen, me, Sylvia Matson, the group of Cruzado Catalan, Neos Domingo, and Beatrice Noeda. And I have to thank my funding which is the Aardewater Kring. It's actually a group of alumni people from the university who want to support the university and to actually help the research because I think it's nice research what we're doing. So alumni people funding fundamental research. Okay, as an introduction, I think I'm a little bit late now because this has all been treated by other people already. So what the introduction? We want to make domain structures. New domain structures which are, don't exist in other kind of phases in bulk so the simple example here, with bismuth ferrite, you have, for example, connectivity at the domain walls, which is not possible if you don't have the domain structures. Here, just briefly, excellently uh, explained by the flex electric talk, we have an AC domain structure, and by the flex electric effect, we can create additional polarization, so we induce a rotation of the polarization away from the main axis. So we create artificially a monoclinic phase in these lead titanate thin films which would not be possible if it were not domains, not domain structures. My topic, it's about barium titanate. Well, the very famous the four crystal structures, of course the cubic, and then three ferroelectric structures. You can play a little bit with all those structures and intertwine them in some way, create new effects, if you use the combination of them. For example, in this very nice study, in the group of Gopalan, they have a bulk, barium titanate single crystal, and they have some interplay between the tetragonal and autonomic phase. And in that way, by interplaying them and having them at the same time, at the domain places, they create some places close to the domains, to the main walls, where you have a different polarization. Not tetragonal, not autonomic, something in between. So they rotate the polarization, and they actually measure higher case electric response in those regions up to, I think, 800 uh, gigacolon per newton. I'm going to work on barium titanate thin films. So just a brief, fast going through the all theoretical results of the strained barium titanate thin films. So this is an initial calculation where you put barium titanate on a substrate and then calculate up initial what would be happening to the barium titanate. They did not consider domains in this work. So they got very nice results. But for the domains, we don't still don't know what's happening. So this is a little bit older, actually. This is a, a parts of diagram where they use Landau theory. And they actually get a very rich domain structure. The many, so there are many phases in this, bear, in this phase diagram. And they're all very close in energy and very close in temperature and strain. So it's all around, centered around zero. In for small strain values. So at the low temperature, you have some autorhombic or autorhombic derived structures. For example, here the simple autorhombic one, or here an autorhombic with a distortion. If you zoom in in this area, we can see that there are basically four kinds of domain structures. 
you can have the A1, A2 in plane domains. You can also have the A1, C, so then AC domains. So there are the, the two basic domains. It's actually quite common in, in more materials. But what they also predicted for this material is that you have some distortions. If you have an A1, A2, there's an additional is a distortion out of plane. So you create a small out of plane polarization in addition to the in plane polarizations. So this would be some monoclinic phase. Also for the AC phase, you can also have an additional in plane polarization, which is not observed in the bulk materials of bearing titanate. There are many, many other theoretical predictions, calculations, modeling. So this is phase field modeling. The group of Long and Chen they actually have a very rich phase diagram around zero with, well, a lot of phases possible or, or mixtures of phases. So it's possible to create many new phases, which we like, and we can create some new physics over these phases. This is the last theoretical slide. So all these papers were all probably about 10 years ago or later, but there's still recent interest in this phase diagram. So this is up initial calculations, which you will hear about in the last talk. So please stay for the last talk as well. Okay, my results, it's experimental results. I've been growing very titanate fan films. They're about 19 nanometers thick on a neodymium scannate substrate. Well, not very important, but the strain is about 0.1%. So it's close to zero. We've been uh, having high quality films. As you can see from the X-ray diffraction with the oscillations, we have some the surface. It's a little bit rough, but it's good enough. And we also actually have a small stontron rutenite bottom electrode to do measurements. But this is the results what we got for our bare titanate at about 0% strain. At room temperature, so there are, there are two possibilities at room temperature. We have the, either the A1, A2, or the one with additional other plane polarization. If we go a little bit higher in temperature, so above 50 degrees Celsius, we transform this A1, A2 into AC. And then at about the build transition temperature, we go to the power electric phase. So we basically measure this line of the parser diagram. <coughs> so this is the, the piezo force microscopy image of the room temperature phase. We can see if we look at well, this image, so this is the model of it, you can see that the polarization points left, down, left, well, so the in-plane, in-plane. What we can see is that one of these domains is actually bigger than the other one. Why is that? Well, the substrate, it's not a cubic substrate. So one in-plane left parameter of the substrate is longer than the other one. So it, has a, so it prefers to be along the longer axis. So this domain gets bigger than the other one. We can also see that the domains are quite long. That's because this is a high, very high quality film. If we have a little bit worse quality film, then we can see the domains both this side and this side. So, so here we have a few regions where it's perpendicular side, but then we have more of them. So this, uh, this is a very high quality film because there's no reason actually why it would form infinitely long for these domains. So now we know from this image, it's either this one or this one. So how do we know which one it's exactly? We go to the X-ray. We take a 001 Bragg peak with the, the Bragg peak of the barium titanate. We can see some finite size oscillations. And if we look at the diffuse scattering around it, we can see two peaks appearing, two very small weak peaks, there and there. So if we look at the distance between the peaks and the bulk peak, <coughs> the black peak, so this distance, it corresponds to 100 nanometers, which is exactly what we found in the PFM. So we found the peaks related to the domains, both in the PFM and the X-ray. So what does it mean that we see in X-ray peaks for this structure? If we look at X-ray, intensity in X-rays, it goes like scattering factor, and we have the, the out of plane, well, movement of the ions, displacement of the ions. Since we're in an out of plane Bragg peak, there's only an out of plane component in the X-rays. So that means that with the, in the out of plane component, something should move. So that means that the movement of the ions is out of plane. So here in this structure, there's no out of plane movement of ions, no periodic oscillations, no periodicity of this out of plane. So it must mean that we have this structure because we see something in the X-ray. Now we go a little bit higher in temperature. 
we go to the AC phase. Here we have a PFM image. We can see, well, long domains. They're horizontal domains. We have an AC structure. And we can see that the structure, it's a nice AC structure. We still don't know which one of these two it is. Maybe we can figure out later. We see in the PFM two regions. One region a little bit darker, one region a little bit brighter. And actually they correspond to super domains. So we can have both the AC with polarization up and right, and the other one with polarization down. So that would be a 180 degree domain wall. How is this domain wall exactly? We can see that here is a zigzag structure of the domain wall. It goes zigzag to have the elastic matching between these two phases. To, uh, to mediate in some 90 degree domain wall way, a 180 degree switch. What you can also see, the domains are actually quite long. We did a 10 micron scan and we saw the lines. It's maybe hard for you to see, but there is a line coming from the bottom to the top without anything happening to it, except for the super domains. So only the super domains are the only things which disturb this image. If there were no super domains, it would go on forever and forever. Well, why, does the, why is the domain infinitely long? Because we have never ever measured domain in the other direction. That's again because the substrate is anisotropic. So the in-plane polarization prefers to be along the long axis of the substrate. So there's a high preferential orientation to be along one direction only. And only with structural defects, you can see some superdomains. We look again at the X-ray of this phase. We know at room temperature we have very weak peaks. We go a little bit higher in temperature, we see very strong peaks. Well, the periodicity here and there it changed. It corresponds to the new periodicity of the new phase. So this is 70 nanometer like we see in the PFM. And because this is much weaker intensity, we know that polarization is much weaker. So that the out of plane polarization is much weaker than in the AC phase. Which is logical because here it's only a little bit and here it's a full out of plane polarization in one of the domains. <coughs> so what can we do with these kind of structures? We've done some macroscopic paraelectric polarization loops. Well, what does it look like? It's a, for a thin film, it's a very slim loop. The coercive field is only 4 kilovolt per centimeter, so for a thin film, it's actually quite small. What does it mean if it's very small? It means it should be very easy to switch the polarization. So what we think, what's happening, because it's a very slim coercive field, because we're really, really a little bit in the monotoning phase, you apply an electric field, it just continually rotates to a full out of plane polarization. And then, if you remove the electric field, it will just go back instantly. So here's the current, so you can see that the displacement also between the peaks is very small. We see that the course of also the built-in field is actually much bigger than the course field. So it could actually also be, and here we have a half loop. And if we then inverse it and reverse it again, then we can get a full normal polarization loop. And then this coercive field would actually correspond to a more logical coercive field for bare titanium thin films. It's more a value like which retort important other materials. So actually it looks like we have only one switching mechanism, and then the back switching goes ex to exactly the same pathway as, go as going here. Okay, I would like to point you to the, the poster I also have. It's in the far corner on the right. So we actually have some models and some observation about how is the, the transition between these two phases and actually the real model of how the switching is actually going. So if anyone has some theoretical insight into how the switching could happen, I would be happy to uh, have your suggestions. So that uh, brings me to the conclusions. We have made different and new phases. We have at room temperature a CA1, CA2 phase. It's a monoclinic distortion. If we go at higher temperature with either AC phase or AA star, CA star phase, we have no experimental method to, to distinguish between these two. So we still don't know which one of the two it is. And then, of course, we go to the parametric phase. What we also have is a transition close to room temperature. So it's 50 degrees Celsius. So you're always very close to some transition from one phase to the other phase. So in that sense, it's very nice for applications because you're not very sen also the temperature is quite easy. And we can switch 
by the rotation of the polarization. So this would actually be, should be beneficial for the piezoelectric effect. So this should be a high piezoelectric material, but we still have to measure it. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for keeping time <laughs> for questions. Was too clear? <laughs> Everything was clear. Oh, you didn't understand anything? The, s the thickness of your film was how large? It was about 90 nanometers for most of the films. And uh, the lateral size of domains is 100 nanometers or something like yeah. that? Yeah. So in our films, it's, 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 it's more or less comparable. comparable. Yeah. Uh -huh. But we have also some thicker and some thinner films, and the periodicity changes a little bit only. Um, very interesting results. Uh, I want to ask you uh, one quick question. It's about uh, the Curie temperature of your film. Have you measured the Curie temperature of your film? Uh, we measured it by both PFM and by X-rays. So by PFM, we have PFM loops. At room type, you can see PFM loops. And above the Curie temperature, we see no loops at all. And by X-ray, we can see that the domains are actually disappearing, and we have the lattice constant is changing at the Curie temperature. I might have the slide. No, maybe not. Okay, I don't have it. Uh, what is the te Curie temperature? So it's about 130. 130. Yeah. So not, not much difference from Bark, right? Yeah, exactly okay. as you expect from the theory, because you expect it's about zero strain, so okay. it should not be much different than the bulk value. How does your cohesive field compare to bulk value? Is it about the same or different? Uh, it's still a little bit bigger. So bulk value is about two kilovolt per centimeter. We, we measure four. Okay. So it's still two times bigger. But for film stems, you should expect a dramatic increase. Okay, thank you. And you don't see any, uh, any residual domain uh, above the C, like previous speaker? Uh, I don't. <laughs> the PFM at very high temperatures is difficult. So. Maybe, maybe not. You probably ex explain it. What gives rise to this built-in electric field, which is very strong, much larger than your cohesive field? I don't know the real reason. I'm sorry. <laughs> that that's something I still have to figure out. Why we have a, such a huge course built-in field? It's across the thin film or is uh, in plane thin film? In plane. So it's. Uh, So this would be the built-in course of building field, and then this, or half of it, is the course of field. And the real reason of why we have such a huge built-in field, we still don't really know yet. But the electric field is applied uh, along the uh, thin film now. Ah, yeah, so the, we measure out of plane. So we have a, the bulk, so we have a thin film, and then we measure the top-bottom. So last chance for questions. If not, I will thank you once more. <laughs> and I will ask the next speaker, which is Junya Tsukada. And he will speak about disorder in barium titanate probed by angle resolved polarized Raman scattering. Thank you, Professor Kamba. And uh, I also appreciate the uh, organizers for preparing this nice conference. Uh, in the present, uh, recently, uh, we built up the new Raman scattering system. And uh, this, in this study, I applied this system to the barium titanate to understand, understand the uh, disorder in the cubic phase. Um, Please have a look at this picture. And this one is a barium titanate crystal with a 90 degree domain configuration. And this figure was uh, colored by the Raman's, Raman imaging. Uh, it shows very clearly uh, the 90 degree, degree domain configurations. But important thing here is that by using the Raman's uh, imaging, the another co domain configuration was found. Oh. 
why the Raman scattering appears in a different way? The reason is very easy. The Raman scattering is expressed by the two rank tensor like this. So Raman scattering is very, uh, very sensitive to the sample configuration and uh, the direction of the incident light and the scattered light. Uh, in addition to the uh, polari polarization uh, condition of the uh, condition of the incident and the scattered light. So uh, to make the best use of Raman scattering from crystals, these four uh, points should be sati satisfied. The first one is the mapping stage to scan the sample or uh, sample range. And in that case, so many spectra should, uh, are needed to obtain. So short time acquisition time is also needed. And uh, to access the each Raman tensor component, uh, the system should be very easy to be changed, the scattering geometry. And as you know, at the first point, uh, the um, ferroelectric material there are many interesting, uh, in interesting uh, peaks at the low frequency range. So wide frequency range measurements are also necessary. But commercial system does not satisfy all the points. So I built up the new system, angle resolved Raman scattering system was built. What I'd like to do here is that to figure out the the nature of the material's dynamics from the large amount spectrum. This figure is the schematic diagram of the uh, angle resolved Raman scattering system. The mapping stage is installed in the microscope, on the microscope, and the short time acquisition time was uh, achieved by using the CCD and the short length spectrometer. And the third point is very important that uh, by using the half wave plate inside the uh, mi microscope, we can um, control the wave plate of the uh, polarized incident beam. And uh, we can control the half wave plate by using the computer, and we can, uh, uh, we can control the uh, scattering geometry very easily, even at the high temperature, uh, extreme uh, conditions. And uh, low frequency measurement was achieved by the grating type supernotch filters. And in this study, uh, I applied this system to the barium titanate to understand the disorder in the cubic phase. If the barium titanate is homogeneous, the small displacement of the titanium ion results in the uh, macroscopic change in the crystal structure. In that case, in that case of the cubic phase, all Raman uh, tensor should be zero. In other words, no Raman scattering is expected in the cubic phase. However, as it is known that uh, clear Raman scattering have, have been reported. Uh, in addition to the Raman scattering, uh, various results imply the existence of uh, disorder in the cubic phase. Uh, for example, the XRD measurement reveals uh, uh, diffuse scattering streaks at each black point. And the pair distribution functions indicate the uh, off-centering of the titanium ion. These uh, properties are not expected for the homogeneous cubic phase described by the displacive model. From the view viewpoint of Raman scattering, now it is necessary to answer these three questions. First one is, what is the origin of these peaks? And uh, which, uh, which mode does it belong to? And finally, to answer, uh, to uh, distinguish order disorder nature from the displacive nature, 
we need to measure the temperature dependence of the Raman spectra. Okay, let's move on the result. And this figure shows the Raman spectra at each polarization angles. As you can see that the, um, the peaks appears very um, depending on the polarization angle of the light. The angle dependence of Raman scattering is described by using the, this contour map. It clearly shows the periodic change in the KSI elastic scattering and uh, phonon peaks. And the difference of uh, KSI elastic scattering and phonon peaks are the peak angle is 45 degrees shifted. And uh, this right figure shows the spectra at 700 Kelvin. That is above the band's so-called band's temperature. Even at very high temperature, the clear Raman scattering is appeared uh, in the same manner with uh, just above Curie temperature. Just the difference is the broadening of the peaks. Uh, these, uh, these spectra can be fitted by assuming the damped harmonic oscillator model multiplied by Bose-Einstein population factor for the phonon peaks and Lorentzian function for the case elastic scattering. So uh, we conclude that these Raman scattering uh, is a first order process, not a second or third order process. In addition, the periodic change of these uh, peaks uh, implies a two rank tensor. So the, uh, the periodic change in the uh, peak intensity also supports the, um, this support the, uh, these peaks are first order Raman scattering. And, uh, uh, the, these Raman scattering can be observed above the band temperature. So uh, we consider that the Raman scattering arises from the microscopic origin. Now, uh, now, now I answer the first question. The origin of mode are first order process. So let's move on the second question, the mode assignment. And to assign the mode first, at, at the first step, I assume the uh, eight site order disorder model proposed by Comes at all. Uh, this model says that the uh, titanium ion is always, uh, always deviated from the center to the one, 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 uh, eight equivalent positions. And in that case, the crystal structure or no, the structure, symmetry of the uh, unit cell becomes a, a 3M. And we assume the eight equivalent domains uh, and the calculated result is uh, summarized in this figure. This figure shows the Raman scattering intensity as a function of uh, angle of the incident light and uh, Raman, Raman tensor component. Uh, it must be difficult to understand, so I cut one, uh, one plane and summarize it like that. The difference of A mode and E mode is that the peak angle is uh, 45 degrees shifted. And one more difference is the minimum uh, intensity of the VH, VH scattering geometry. Uh, in the case of A mode, the uh, minimum uh, intensity should be zero. On the other hand, in the e case of E mode, the minimum intensity not, not equal to zero. So judging from this, uh, judging from the comparison between the experimental results and the uh, calculation result, uh, we attribute the KSI elastic scattering to be E mode, while the uh, phonon peaks are attributed to be uh, A1 mode. 
Of course, uh, I checked we checked various kinds of models, but uh, so far, the eight site order disorder model is the most likely to likely to be the origin of Raman scattering in this study. So, <coughs> by measuring angle resolved Raman scattering, we uh, we determine the origin of the mode to be first order process from 3M local structure. And we assigned KSI elastic scattering to be E mode type and phonon peaks to be A1 mode. And, and uh, fr from the comparison between experimental result and the calculation result, we can determine the, uh, we determine the uh, Raman tensor ratio. That is very big uh, progress, I guess. Uh, because in an uh, older sense, everyone, uh, everyone compares the Raman peak like this peak is stronger, weaker, just it. However, by measuring the angle resolved Raman scattering, we can uh, discuss the physical quantity. The, uh, tensor ratio becomes large, small. I had that uh, first principle calculation and can determine the uh, Raman tensor. So uh, I believe that our measurement system can be a bridge between the theoretical calculation and the experimental result. And at last, I'd like to show you the temperature dependence of Raman spectra. This spectra, uh, apparently, this spectra shows the KSI elastic scattering changes markedly, while um, almost no change is found in the phonon peaks. Um, by fitting these peaks, you know, the fitting result is shown in this figure. The phonon, phonon peak shift does not change at all temperature, while the uh, KSI elastic scattering widths changes very markedly, showing like critical slowing down behavior. So uh, in, as long as Raman scattering study, uh, we conclude that order disorder type mechanism is, uh, order disorder type mechanism dominates this phase transition. Okay, let me summarize my talk. Um, by measuring the uh, angular dependence of the Raman scattering from the barium titanate, we uh, try to understand the uh, disorders in the cubic phase of cubic phase. And we answered these three questions. The uh, Raman scattering in a cubic phase originated from the first order Raman scattering. And that Raman scattering is come from disorders with uh, R3, uh, R3M structure. And we assign KSI elastic to be E mode and phonon peaks to be A1 mode. And in this system, we can succeed in determining the uh, Raman component ratio. And by measuring the temperature dependence of the Raman spectra, we observed critical slowing down behavior and without any softening of phonon mode. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments? So, um, in terms of separating things out, in terms of phonons and the quasi elastic scattering peak, um, you could understand, I think, the quasi-elastic scattering peak is an anharmonic and stabilized phonon. Yeah. That, and and uh, so um, in that sense, um, I'm not sure that the, uh, how you analyze things, you say it's just a, a first order process, and but it seems to me that they're, uh, it's a little blurry, isn't it, in terms of the dynamics that are, uh, underlying this. If you do, you know, first principles, uh, ab initio molecular dynamics, uh, you clearly see that. 
these, no. these uh, anharmonically no. uh, stabilized phonons that are tem temperature uh, dependent, and they show the slowing down. Uh, I understand your question. Uh, it uh, must be right. In, but in the present study, um, uh, I'd like to say that uh, the uh, periodic changing pattern of the KSI elastic scattering is the same as the uh, E-mode tensor. So the, uh, so the um, how can I say, the basic axis is closely related with the E-mode, the case E-mode. I don't mean uh, that the is, uh, I don't mean mm, the E-mode can be calculated from the first principle. Okay. Um, if I understood correctly, you did any measurement in the cubic phase of Bion Titanet? Um, uh, so if you go below the curry temperature, yeah. what happened to this peak? Does, does it vanish? Does it go to another well-known peak in Roman spectral? Ah, okay. Uh, below the curry temperature, the tetragonal peaks appears in addition to the, these uh, rhombohedral modes. So, for example, the very market, very strong case elastic scattering appears like that in the tetragonal phase. That, that is correspond to the uh, tetragonal Raman's tensor symmetry. Last question. So, I, ah, okay. If I can ask you, or if you can comment, you yeah. claim based on this that you have a quasi-elastic peak, yeah. uh, that it is all this other uh, mechanism which, which dominates here. But if you assume that you have over a uh, very soft phonon, yeah, yeah. which becomes overdent, then you can have a dis displacing mechanism. Uh, and, this, yeah. and if you are above TC, soft mode is always overdent. So yeah, it if the mode is overdent, even at the 700 Kelvin? Yes, it is. Uh, then. Oh, we can, cannot distinguish all the disorder or displace it. Yeah. In my understanding, the uh, damping should be larger and larger as approaching TC. So, uh, so if the temperature raises very high, then the case elastic scattering should be phonon peak, behaves like phonon peaks. But we cannot uh, observe such kind of phonon. And the damping far above TC. Yeah. Okay. So as long as our result. Okay. Thank you very much. We have to move to last <laughs> talk. Thank you. And the last speaker is Anna Grinebon, and she was uh, from <laughs> from Germany, and uh, from. of Duisburg Essen and she will speak about ab initio phase diagram of barium titanate under epitaxial strain again revisited okay thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present our results here at this conference. So this is uh, basically a joint work between uh, me at the University of Duisburg-Essen and uh, Claude Edera and Madura Mar Marate from um, the ETH in Zurich. So I think after all these talks and, and this audience in principle, I can keep the motivation very short. Um, in ferroelectric materials, there's a strong coupling between the strain and the ferroic order parameter so here, oh, this pointer is really weak. Let me try the other one. Oh, okay. Um, so there's a strong coupling between the structural properties and the ferroic phases here. You have a cubic phase, and then at the ferroic phase transition, there's this uh, tetragonal distortion, and, and the orthorhombic and rhomboidal phase also are coupled to strong structural distortion. 
And therefore, one can uh, use the successful route of the strain engineering just by um, um, growing a film on a certain substrate, and then the film has to adjust to the lattice constant, which um, allows to couple this um, strain to the ferroic properties, and then um, one can, for example, tune the transition temperature. And here is some example from literature where you can see this nice um, uh, linear increase of the transition temperature with uh, um, strain, which then can be used also to adjust the highest piezoelectric, dielectric, or electrocaloric responses of the material just by choosing the certain substrate. Um, and it would be very convenient to have the full phase diagram, and then you can just choose a certain substrate with a certain strain for any wanted functionality of your material. However, to establish such a complete phase diagram and experiment is quite heavy. You've seen two talks be, be before that al already for one substrate and one strain value, it's, it's really hard to grow and make all this um, um, uh, uh, pro processing of the data. And therefore, it is uh, much more com convenient, I think, to um, use the theory to predict the phase diagram and then only pick up the interesting strain ranges and experiment afterwards. And uh, here, um, um, lots of work has been done based on this um, lambda theory, which is a, a phenomenological approach based on some parametrization. And this has already been shown that in the science paper, um, depending on the chosen parametrization, the um, spread and the obtained transition temperatures is defined. And uh, the problem is even uh, more dramatic if one wants to look at domain structures. So what you, uh, I've um, chosen here are just three examples of different Phase diagram is published by Perzeb and co-workers, and there are various other phase diagrams. And depending on the parametrization and depending on the assumed um, domain structure previous to the simulation, very different phases have been found. So I think from this variety of phase diagrams, it is obvious that one maybe should also use ab initio methods to investigate this phase diagram, which do not, in principle, need any assumption for the domain structure. However, if one um, thinks about density functional theory, you have in principle no temperature and you are in, um, 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 restricted to rather small systems, so large scale domains are not accessible in this approach. And therefore, what we did are uh, ab initio based methods. Here we uh, used the uh, FEREM code by Takeshi Nishimatsu, which is basically um, using the same approach as uh, in the previous talks on the effective Hamiltonian, which scores. It's going back to an um, earlier um, concept of uh, David Vanderbilt and co-workers that one can map the um, electronic and structural degrees of freedom in the ferroelectric material on an um, effective description based on the ferroelectric soft mode and the acoustic mode only, and then one can um, construct such an energy description which is only depending on this degrees of freedom and then the external strain and external fields. And then one does not need any parametrization from phenomenological arguments, but then can um, make the parametrization in density function of your simu um, simulation. And as one has only a very reduced number of degrees of freedom, this allows to perform molecular dynamic simulation. Here we have um, done the simulation in periodic boundary conditions and just fixed the strain tensor to mimic the interface condition at a, a certain substrate and they use uh, simulation cells of about 13 nanometers, and the uh, Nose um, Poincaré um, thermostat has been applied, which allows them to really um, uh, equilibrate the system at a certain temperature, and then cool down or heat up the temperature, uh, the system, and um, um, check which uh, phase is most stable at a certain temperature range. So <clears throat> if one looks into uh, literature, so for sure this has been done. There's this famous work by Oswaldo Dieges, where exactly this um, approach has been used to um, look at the phase diagram. And here one nicely see this linear, sees this linear increase of the transition temperatures, and the polarization is pointing either out of plane for compressive strain or in plane uh, for tensile strain and some mixture here for low, low temperatures and low strain values. However, here there are no domains, and this is clearly contradicting the experimental results. We have seen, for example, two talks before or in other works, um, or for example, also this um, phase field um, simulation, which also do not need any assumption of the domain structure. So why are there no domains in this ab initio-based code, and how can one um, get a phase diagram with the domains? So <coughs> here um, you see um, 
uh, on the phase diagram we obtained in our simulation, and on the first glance you see, okay, this is basically the same which has been obtained before. So we also have this um, either the polarization out of plane for compressive strain or in plane for tensile strain and this linear dependency. Um, one short remark. Here um, you may have noticed that this transition temperature is about 100 um, Kelvin too low, which is an, a systematic problem in this chosen approach um, due to the parameterization, for example, because the lattice constant in the density functional theory is not completely correct and as we are missing thermal expansion terms and so on. However, this is a systematically trend which is well understood and uh, therefore one can um, also um, look at the qualitative trends here without any um, restriction. So <clears throat> as a next step, let's have a closer look on the polarization profile. So what you see here on the right hand side is the polarization out of plane for increasing compressive strain. The polarization increases as does the transition temperature as expected. And under tensile strain, um, one has a similar trend for the polarization in plane, here given in the left figure. Um, in, uh, in this case, one has an increasing polarization, increasing uh, transition temperature. However, you see directly below the transition temperature, the polarization is not saturated. And there's a large temperature range where one has a linear increase of the polarization until the uh, second kink here, um, there the polarization seems to saturate. So what is happening? And therefore, we looked into the local dipole configuration and ju just um, averaged our dipoles over a certain time interval. And you see that we have this nice domain configuration. So in this uh, strain temperature range here, uh, there is no uniform AA phase as has been predicted before, but rather a, a local tetragonal phase with um, polarization along A and B, um, similar to this A1, A2 phase, um, which has been discussed two talks of, uh, before for this Kurzev diagram. So why is this phase here um, mo most favorable? Um, um, if a system um, can um, locally uh, get into this tetragonal phase below the transition temperature, it can adjust to the phase sequence fo found in the bulk material. They, one would also expect this tetragonal phase uh, below the transition temperature just uh, a global tetragonal phase in um, plane would not be allowed by the para, um, uh, um, elastic boundary conditions and uh, therefore some domain walls are necessary to re relax this elastic energy and to allow for the local formation at least of a most favorable phase. And here on top you can see uh, um, the um, polarization profile across such a domain wall and you see that there's a large variation of the polarization parallel to the domain wall, which results in a high energy penalty and in a rather large um, uh, wide width of this domain wall. So <clears throat> if one, um, uh, for example, fits this um, tangent hyperbolicus profile, one can extract the uh, domain wall width, which is in the range of five nanometers here for our film with about 0.75% strain. And um, this is also in a rather good agreement to experimental results on uh, this elastic domain wall or to this estimation I met previously by density functional theory um, at zero temperature. So one has this rather wide domain wall with a rather high domain wall energy and therefore it just couldn't fit into the simulation cell which has been used in this older work. And I think this is the only reason why it has been overlooked. And if one now takes this into account, one gets this uh, revisited phase diagram. So again, there's this general trends discussed before, but in addition, there's a second phase transition line between the multi-domain phase found below the transition temperature for tensile strain and then the single phase um, of, um, below this second transition temperature. And here in this uh, region, there one also has polarization out of plane. One uh, gets an AC-BC uh, domain state so basically, which this corresponds to 60 degree domain walls uh, for the um, orthorhombic polarization. Um, as a next step, we also looked at the um, effect of a uh, general bioxid strain. So what you see here in these different subfigures are um, the, the stable phases for different temperatures. X and Y corresponds to the different values of strain in plane. And please just concentrate on the general trends. So first, at high temperatures, one is in the paraelectric phase as given in white. And then at some temperatures, the um, um, tetragonal or uh, locally tetragonal phase with multi-domains sets in. Under further cooling, this transforms to the um, ortho, uh, so, so the um, quasi-orthorhombic 
polarization, with polarization along AC, for example, or uh, with some multi-domain uh, phase with local 110 polarization. And then if one cools further, one ends up in the phase of polarization along 111, and then also different multi-domain uh, phases are possible. And if one looks in a little bit in detail on this, we can see uh, that um, one always gets the, um, the highest transition temperature along the longest lattice constant, which is somehow reasonable. And for the polarization out of plane, this transition temperature depends on uh, the combination of the in-plane strain, whereas for the in-plane um, transition temperatures, only the clamped lattice constant plays a role. In addition, we found that especially if one has a tensile strain in-plane, one stabilizes this multi-domain phase. Um, to, um, 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 nah. In order to sort these domains a little bit better, we looked into literature here in uh, this paper by Martin based on uh, Landau Ginsburg theory. And here they made a detailed symmetry analysis about, um, about the possible domain state one could expect in a bulk ferroelectric barn titanate. And for all local polarization, one would expect 180 degree domain walls. So these domains are no elastic domains. Um, therefore, we do not uh, um, expect that they may relax any elastic energy and they are thus not favorable in our ideal system without a real surface. But we find all the other domains which have been predicted there, basically. So for the local tetragonal state, um, this is only the 90 degree domain wall, which um, corresponds to this AB uh, multi-domain phase. If one uh, locally has polarization along 110, then either 60, 90, or 120 domain degree domain walls would be possible in bulk-like samples. And here it has already been shown that this phase is high in energy, and indeed we found these two. Thereby, uh, the first one um, appears for small values of strain, um, and uh, the second one appears if uh, one of the lattice constants uh, um, is compressed in strain, and, um, and then there's no overall polarization along this compressed lattice constant. Um, and last, for the low temperature uh, phases um, with the polarization along 111 locally, then there are again two possible elastic domain walls, and both appear in our simulation depending on the relative strength of the strain along the two lattice constants. And one can again say that the um, global polarization along a, a shorter uh, compressed lattice constant uh, cancels out. And if one in, um, in addition, have A and B under tensile strain, then also the um, global polarization along C may cancel out by the formation of this third class of domain walls. So in this then um, can explain this com rather complicated domain structure where one find all these different kind of domains depending on the relative um, um, strain values. And with this, I want to summarize my talk. So <clears throat> I think that all of you know that the strain engineering of a ferroelectric phase diagram is a rather successful route, and that they need especially um, theoretical simulation to establish the whole phase diagram to make it more easy for our experimental colleagues to find the important strain range and cook, look into detail if they find the same results. And it is very important if one does such simulation that one really takes rather large cells into account because otherwise the domain walls just don't fit into this simulation cell. And these domain walls are necessary to um, uh, recover the local, uh, at least locally, the um, global uh, phase uh, sequence, which is most favorable in barium titanate. And then one can also make some uh, predictions about the highest transition temperature and the highest polarization based <coughs> on um, the inspection of this uh, Diagram. And with this, I want to thank you and thank you as well. <laughs> so, please, questions, comments. So, so, is there any so, so, so the phase field model is based on some Landau Ginsburg yeah, potential. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it, this it, is it, here um, this effector for Hamiltonian. Yeah, yeah, I understand the difference, but uh, my question is in the research, what kind of. Okay, uh, so um, w um, my cells are still too small to cover some nucleation effect and um, some large scale twinning or something, which is also possible in this phase field simulation. And this is also why this phase field diagram is a little bit more complicated because then one, one may get a superposition of these different locally phases, which I don't get. 
second question. Everybody is already tired. Uh, it's quite late. I'm sorry that we have longer session than it was expected. Uh, so thank you very much once more. Indeed. I would like to thank all speakers of this session. And we will have now poster session next two hours. So they've moved the posters are half in the boardroom and half in the rotunda. Just so that you know, you should go to the boardroom to see some posters that you might not notice immediately. And if a presenter is not present and you want to talk to him, it's probably because they're going to get some food. So please try to see all the posters. Thank you very much. <laughs>